you could read some of Paul's words and conclude that he was saying that, that the law was abolished, that it was done away with, that it was a negative thing that God had to get rid of. The problem with that, again, is that he has many positive things to say. The problem with that is that best scholarship shows him in complete harmony with the teachings of Yeshua. The problem is that he himself demonstrates right to the end of his life, as much as it's recorded in Acts, that he himself is, is living by the Torah. Yes, in light of the new covenant. So I understand why people teach that Paul abolished the law, but, it, but it's a serious misconception based on several factors. Let me list about five points here. Number one, Paul, whose Hebrew name was Saul, took the message of the Messiah to the Gentiles without requiring them to follow the Torah. That's why some people think that he abolished the law. No, he understood that God had never called the Gentiles as separate nations and peoples to all come under Torah law. So he understood that he could take the message of the Messiah to them without requiring them to follow Torah. Two, Paul clearly explained that we are ultimately made right with God through faith, which is followed by a pattern of good works, rather than by our good works themselves, since none of us can fully live up to the law's requirements. Number three, some of Paul's teachings are quite deep and complex and have therefore been misunderstood. Four, Paul emphasized how God had broken down the barrier that separated Jews from Gentiles, uniting them in one spiritual family. And five, Paul clearly viewed the Torah from a different perspective in light of the inbreaking of the Messianic era. But this does not mean that Paul taught that the Torah was now null and void. To the contrary, Paul lived and died as a Torah observant Jew, never taught that Jewish believers in the Messiah should abandon the Torah, although it appears that if taking the good news of the Messiah to the Gentiles meant that he sometimes had to break a certain law or tradition, such as a dietary restriction, then he would be willing to do that for the sake of their salvation. A principle that could even be deduced from rabbinic thinking as well. Rabbis would say that, that you can break the Sabbath in order to save a life. If, if especially a, a Jewish life. So let's say there's a situation whereby a friend of yours collapses and you've got to use your phone whereas you normally wouldn't use it on the, cell, uh, on, on the Sabbath or you had to rush that person to a hospital and drive in a car, that even though, according to traditional Jewish law, that was a violation of the Sabbath, it would be acceptable to do so on the Sabbath. In fact, it would be imperative because of the command to save life. Paul, you can understand, with background and training in Pharisaical Judaism, would have no problem making a right deduction, let alone as a follower of the Messiah, that if... I'm bringing the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. If I am bringing a message of life and death for them, whereby they can know God and be with Him forever, if in order to do that, in order, let's say, to sit down and eat together and not break table fellowship and not reject these people, if I had to eat something I normally wouldn't eat to bring them the message of salvation, certainly that is a kingdom principle that He would have followed. But he never went and told Jews throughout the Torah, abandon it. And to repeat, with the temple destroyed, we have evidence of Jewish believers in Jesus continuing to live Jewish lifestyles that were observed, uh, recognizable enough to the church as a whole, the growing emerging church as a whole, that they were Jewish. We also know from some of their writings that have been preserved among some of the ancient authorities that there was a definite separation coming with the traditions of the rabbis, that there was a definite dichotomy that was being formed there. Well, well did, didn't Paul say that, that Jesus was the end of the law? Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. Let's just turn there. Again, I'm not going to look at every verse. I just want to give you a few principles. The book of Acts presents Paul to us living by the Torah. What does he mean in Romans 10, 4, NIV, Christ is the end of the law, so there may be righteousness for everyone who believes? Well, if you simply understand that the word end, telos in Greek, is often translated goal, end result, 
If you understand it in those terms, which many translators do, I have a whole book just on that phrase, which then refers you to hundreds of other books and articles dealing with it. Messiah is the goal of the law, or the, the end point goal of the law, so that there be righteousness for everyone who believes. He's not saying that he brings it to termination and irrelevance. He's saying he brings it to completion. It's pointing to him. And you'll find that in certain translations, especially those with a Messianic Jewish perspective. And he goes on to quote from Deuteronomy, not to say this is irrelevant, but to say we see this as ultimately pointing in the same direction. I'm just going to give you a list of verses without reading them that have been taken to speak of the law in a negative way. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. It speaks of Jesus abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. So in order, in order to create in himself one new man out of the two, Jew and Gentile. Romans 3.20. There will be no one declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Romans 4.13-15. Romans 6.14. Sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, you're under grace. Romans 7, 5 and 6. We, we've died to the law. We've been released from the law so that we can live, serve in the new way of the Spirit. Romans 7, 8, and 9. Romans 10, 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Galatians 2, 15 and 16. All in your outline here. Galatians 3, 10 through 13. Quoting from Deuteronomy 27. And following Septuagint. Cursed is everyone who's not, who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Galatians 3, 23 to 25. We were held prisoners by the law before faith came. Galatians 5, 4. You who are trying to be justified by the law, you've been alienated from Messiah. You've fallen away from grace. 5, 18 in Galatians. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. 1 Corinthians 7, 19. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Repeat in Galatians 6, 15. Romans 2, 28, 29. That a true Jew is one who is one inwardly, not outward circumcision, but inward. You read those verses and you say, well, I... so much for what you've been saying about Paul. Obviously, this guy had an issue with the law. Obviously, as wrote here, no observant Jew in his right mind would say such things. Even if Jesus didn't abolish the law, Paul did. That's why Christianity is not for Jews. We don't hate the law like Paul. We love it. Let's, uh, let's just remember 2 Peter 3.16 that Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand which ignorant, unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Perhaps there's more to the story. Remember, Acts tells us how Paul lived. And I'm accepting the authority and testimony of the scriptures. Romans 2.13 For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. 2.17-20 and 23 now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what, of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? That's, that seems to be quite a lofty understanding of what the law is all about. Okay, you're a Jew you may think of yourself as more righteous than the Gentiles. This is the, the, the challenge that he's giving. Okay, you've got the law. Do you keep it? Romans 2.25, circumcision has value if you observe the law. Romans 3, 1 and 2, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. Romans 3, 21 and 22, and Romans 3, 33. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This is God's righteousness, which is not attained by our best human efforts, but the law and the prophets point to it, testify of it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Messiah to all who believe. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all, rather we uphold the law. 
Because this is taught in Torah itself, uh, in itself that Abraham believes the Lord. It's counted him for righteousness. And the prophet Habakkuk taught that the just will live by faith. Romans 6, 15, what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. This point about not being under law means not being under this as a system of justification. Not having the scaffolding to support the building once the building is standing. I asked one of my rabbi friends, do you have detailed sets of rules and regulations as to how you talk to your wife every day? I say these words at this time in this way. She says these words at this time in this way. I tell my children that do you, do you just talk? Do you just interact? Yeah, because you have a relationship. Because you love each other and committed to each other, you have a relationship. It's the same with us as children of God. We're not under this system. It now becomes a way of life in God with that which has ongoing relevance and purpose lived out in our own lives. Romans 7 Verses 7, 12, 14, 16, 22, 25, and then chapter 8, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Don't draw any wrong conclusions. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. If I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The law of God is God's own holy standard. And Paul in himself, in his human nature, finds himself falling short of it. And the law now points out his sin and reveals to him his need for grace. And he finds deliverance and freedom and wholeness through God's grace. Jewish New Testament, David Stern's translation, Romans 10.4, for the goal at which the Torah aims is the Messiah who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. Romans 13, 8 and 10, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Similar to what Yeshua taught in Matthew 7.12. If, if you will walk a certain way and live a certain way, you'll live out what the law was actually after. You fulfill the things that God was actually after. And what if there were more parameters that God put on Israel and the Jewish people to keep them separate? And with the breaking in of the Messianic era, some of those walls come down so that they can now be a light to the rest of the world. Could that have been some of the wisdom and intent of God? First Corinthians 9, 8 and 9, Paul quotes the Torah to back his point. Galatians 3, 21, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. First Timothy 1, 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. So, so this is what Paul wrote. And when we look through the book of Acts, the entire story going through the book of Acts from his becoming a follower of Messiah, his ongoing life, he's consistently presented as following what is written in Torah. And yet he emphasized life in the Spirit, life in Messiah. He came into a different relationship with it. It was not hanging over him in a condemning, judgmental way. You may be a rabbinic Jew and say, that's not how I relate to it either. Well, praise God. Good, we're on the same page with that. That's positive. 